Great. Right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the work. New Research, Neuroscience and Information Retrieval at Desires 2021. So let's start by describing the complexity associated with the information retrieval process. Information retrieval process starts by searchers experiencing an information need. They then try to formulate the information need into a query and submit it to a search system. Search system then use that query, match it to the documents and retrieve a set of relevant results to the query. The user then engage with the retrieved results and try to satisfy the need. However, the inform information need can be ambiguous. And as a result of that, the query will be just an approximation of the actual information need, which refers to the gap between an information need and their approximation of it. And that result of the search results not be satisfactory. So then searchers have to engage further with the search process, going through the relevant documents, trying to improve their understanding of their information need, and then reformulate the query and submit it again to the search system. And this process continues until either the search resulted in satisfaction of the information need or the user abandoned the search. So retrieval systems, in order to help improving this process are trying to look at the relevant documents that are perceived by the user and incorporate those information into their retrieval algorithms so that they can provide a better relevant document to the user. They try to do that initially by directly asking users to judge the relevance of a document. And that's known as explicit feedback, where users are judging whether the document is relevant or not. Despite this technique being effective, it's not reliable because it adds a cognitive burden to the user. So the other method of gathering feedback was introduced named implicit feedback, where the relevance of a document was inferred by the interaction that user is doing with the search system and the retrieved results, for example, as researchers have looked into click-through data and dwell time. Other researchers have looked into facial expression and physiological features as a source of feedback. But these measures are looking at understanding the concept of relevance from an indirect way. What we are proposing is by directly tapping to the brain and by monitoring the brain regions activated during an analytical process, we believe that we can reduce or possibly eliminate the gap between a formulated information need and an actual information need. So the work has been done in looking at the neural activation underlying IR processes are called NeuroSearch. And it has recently drawn an increasing interest in information retrieval and science communities. Scientists have been trying to understand different components in IR, for example, relevance, information needs, satisfaction. And they have employed a wide range of brain imaging techniques. In this talk, I'm only focused on fMRI and EEG because they are the two most popular neuroimaging techniques. And I'm gonna present some of the works I've done using these techniques. But if you're interested to read more about it, I refer you to the paper to see other works that are happening in, the, in this area. So this chart starts by quickly describe the basis of functioning magnetic resonance imaging or called fMRI. It's a complex process related to measuring the blood flow, the blood volume, and the ratio of oxygenated blood to the deoxygenated blood. The signal that we capture is called blood oxygenation level dependent, and it acts as a proxy to neural activity. It has some disadvantages using this technique, one being the limitation of the types of tasks you can design, because the participants have to lie down and stay still while they're in an MRI machine. As, and also the other complexity is the, the fact that the bold signal acts as a proxy, as I mentioned which could then couple with other physiological variables related to the blood flow. But it has great advantages. 
One is that it has a superior spatial resolution and it allows to measure the brain activity of an entire brain volume. This is particularly important when you try to investigate and understand phenomena that you're trying to do for the first time. Taking this advantage, we looked at the concept of relevance and try to understand what are the brain regions involved in a, real, in, 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 in a relevant judgment process. And what we wanted to understand is whether, or our hypothesis actually was, whether there would be a different brain regions when participants uh, interacting with a relevant document compared to irrelevant documents. What we found was quite interesting. We identified three brain regions that were involved in both relevant and non-relevant uh, judgment. But the only thing that was different was the activations of these three brain regions. In another study, we looked at the realization of information need. We wanted to see how the realization of information need manifests itself in the brain. So we designed a QA task and what we found out is that there are actually three brain regions involved when participants are realizing information need compared to the scenario where they actually know the answer to those questions. And only one of those regions are higher, have a higher activation when the participants are realizing information need. And that refers to dorsal or posterior cingulates, which is in here. And this is a very central and key region and acts as a hub that switch the internal attention to external attention. And that was a very interesting uh, manifestation of a realization of inf information need in the brain. Obviously brain regions are not working in isolation and there are networks of brain regions that work together. So we look at the functional connectivity network of the brain regions that we identified when participants actually have successful memory retrieval or they actually experience an information need. And what we managed to do by looking at this connectivity network is that the three main components involved within a realization of information need. The first component are a set of brain regions that work together to provide a successful memory retrieval. The second component are the set of brain regions that actually help with an information flow regulation. And the last component helps with a high level perception. And this is the first neuroscience model of information need realization. The second neuroimaging technique I would like to describe is EEG. So in a brain is about 86 billion neurons and they communicate with each other. And this communication creates electrical and magnetic fields. What EEG does is actually records these electrical signals that are happening at the scalp level. The disadvantage of this technique is that it has low spatial resolution and it can easily be contaminated by artifacts, but it has a very important advantage, which is high temporal resolution and it's portable. So as a result that has been used in a lot of clinical applications. So we took, uh, we utilize this advantage of EEG and try to see when the relevant judgment is actually happening in the brain from the moment we show a stimuli to the user. What we saw is that there are two main components. From the moment you show, us, uh, you show a stimuli to a user for the from this first 300 milliseconds, users are actually processing and decoding the object that are presented. And then between the 300 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds of showing, in, in our case, an image, they're actually deciding whether the document is relevant or not. And that was again another surprising result we got because we thought there would be a different time when a user will judge a document that if it's relevant as well as the relevance, which was not, which was not the case. We then looked deeper uh, into uh, the concept of relevance. And we try to see whether there are any different uh, critical activities when we are uh, engaging with 
a graded relevance. And we had three levels. We had high relevance, low relevance, and non-relevance. And in this study, we were interested in three main components uh, within an ERP design, which was proven and shown in the past that are important in a relevant judgment process. What we observed that there are actually significant differences in brain activity when one is judging information of being high relevant or low relevant and non-relevant. But another interesting observation we did was the dual nature of low relevance, which at, 400, at, at uh, N400, we see that it closely resembles the non-relevant and at P600, it closely resembles the high relevance characteristics. The N400 is known for uh, mismatching and mismatch processes in the brain. And the P600 is known for memory retrieval. So with this encouraging results that we obtained over the past decade, uh, IR committee is now in a better position to understand the possibilities and limitations of new research. But we're just scratching, barely scratching the surface. And there's so much more that can be done in this field from the realization of an information need until the stopping of the search process. And that includes also how participants engage with the information, comprehend it, perceive it, process it, and judge it. And also ultimately, how all this information will be taken in and help users to satisfy their information need. But that requires a collaborative effort. And this is um, my invitation for the community to get involved. Thank you. Any quick question from the floor online? Okay, yes, we have one. Let's give the mic. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering how, so when uh, a user searches for documents and then they they want to observe whether a document is relevant, they, they probably need to move their eyes a lot. And does that not uh, break this whole P300 and 400 signal? Because it's not uh, really possible to register these effects anymore, right? Because the, the noise of the eye movements becomes way too big. That, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, so there are mechanisms to minimize this eye, eye movement. Since in this study, we were focusing primarily on how the different grades of relevance are happening, we created a very controlled experimental scenario where the answers to a question were given at word, one word at a time. And this is a very known procedure um, with uh, natural language processing in, in, in an EEG scenario. So what we do is that we're actually showing one word at a time in the middle, and that minimizes the eye movement. OK. Uh, I have one very last quick question for Yasha. And do, do you find any differences in, uh, in the media that you show to the user? So if it's a text or if it's an image, does that activate different areas? Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, the, yes, the text processes are mainly uh, activated in the left hemisphere, whereas the image processes are mainly activated in the right hemisphere. And uh, that's one of the, you know, the biggest differences when you show an image, but there are also other um, brain regions that get activated. For example, with images, you have a lot of perceptual uh, uh, areas of the brain that gets involved. And uh, with the text processing, there are more uh, comprehensive parts of the brain that gets involved. Okay, great. Let's thank Yasha once more. Uh...